welcome to uh, So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, my guest today is someone who's been on the show a number of times before. I'm, I'm so pleased he's back. Andrew Doyle is author, a satirist, and of course, the creator of that social media sensation, Titania McGrath. Uh, he's written what I, one might call a more a serious book. It's just come out, uh, Free Speech and Why It Matters. Free speech and why it matters. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for coming back. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, can you tell me, free speech, why it matters, it says something, doesn't it, that you, in a, in a way, have to write a book about this at the moment? Absolutely. I never thought I would. I never thought I'd be writing a book to defend free speech. I just sort of, that was a given to me. I thought that everyone just assumed free speech was, was the bedrock of a liberal democracy. Um, but I, I, I'm, unfortunately, I, I have to say over the past particularly 10 years or so, I, a lot of us have noted uh, the way in which the principle of free speech has been eroded. Lots of people have become very flippant about it as though they don't really care or they, they even mock people for being free speech warriors or free speech defenders. And you would have thought that that's quite a, quite a positive thing, isn't it? Because it's, it's, quite, it's quite important. And the other very serious thing that has happened now is that uh, free speech has been politicized. So you get a lot of situations where people say, oh, these people are going about free speech. They're just the far right and they're trying to cover up their evil racism or or xenophobia or race or sexism or whatever it might be. Uh, and of course, that's so sad because defending free speech is such an honorable thing that is nonpartisan. It's got nothing to do actually with left and right. And yet it's it started to kindle these really dishonorable suspicions. I think that that's a that's a really sad thing. And I so I wanted to address those issues. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the various threats to free speech that I perceive in society that are so often outright denied by people. There's a real sort of denialism going on. People just saying there isn't a problem, even though you can cite numerous studies and people's experience. It just shows that we, we are in a, in, a, in a perilous state. I think uh, what you say there absolutely resonates with me from my conversations I've had recently, particularly with younger people, uh, at least in my terms, younger people, uh, in the sense that, and I don't know whether you would agree with this, once upon a time, you know, the, the debate about free speech used to be uh, between people who were free speech advocates and those who said, oh, of course I believe in free speech, but, right, mm. that was the always, now it seems to me to be the case, as I think you've alluded to there, that they actually don't believe in it. They don't, they, it's not a but, they just actually don't believe in it anymore. Yeah, I think uh, time and again, there have been studies that have shown that uh, younger people in particular are of the view that free speech ought to be curtailed in certain circumstances, uh, particularly because they perceive it to be a threat to minority rights. And they see this as a kind of a zero sum conflict between free speech and minority rights. Um, I've cited a couple of those studies in the, in, the, uh, in the footnotes of the book, so you'll be able to chase them up to see that I'm not, you know, this is absolutely verifiably the case. Now, I, the argument I'm making is actually that that conflict is illusory, that in fact, the best way to defend the rights of minority groups and marginalized people is to ensure free speech for everyone. And that's really why I, I think it's very important to make sure that people understand that the defense of free speech is not an attack on anyone's rights. It's the opposite of that. And it's it's very sad to me um, that this misconception has become so widespread. It is widespread. And uh, I think sort of being put into practice, uh, you know, you, you mentioned in the book, you say, uh, you, you know, that the answer to hateful speech, for example, or bad speech is more speech. Yes. So I think that's... Right, that's all of the great civil rights luminaries of the 1960s mm. and, and, and further on into the 20th century knew this. They knew that free speech underpinned all of their causes. This is why it, it coincided with the Berkeley movement, the University of, of Berkeley, um, because free speech was part, was part of everything. And we also know uh, from experience and from research that all of the countries in the world today uh, where free speech protections are meagre, you also have uh, the um, oppression of minority groups. They tend to, the, the oppression is just much more intense in those countries where free speech is denied. So the correlation is, is, is absolutely clear. Um, and so there's all sorts of problems, thorny problems that I try and unpick in the book. Um, and it's about sort of acknowledging 
a couple of things. The first thing I did, I do acknowledge in the book is that speech can be hurtful. That, you know, I think it, you'd have to be sociopathic not to be aware that speech can hurt people's feelings. And it can be cruel and it can be uh, wielded irresponsibly and all of those things. And it can be particularly be used to attack minority groups. And you, we've all heard hate fueled demagogues and, and, and people um, you, misusing their, their freedom of speech. But the point that I am trying to make is that actually censoring those people and applying blanket censorship across the board is not, in fact, uh, going to help minorities. It's going to make things worse for a number of reasons that I go through. I don't know how much yeah. you want me to go into that now, but 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 I, 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 that's the argument that I'm presenting. And my my sincere hope is that free speech skeptics in particular will read the book. It's nice and short. It's to the point. It's not padded out. In fact, I, you know, I, I wanted it to be a short, accessible book because uh, you know, I didn't want to write things that I didn't need to write to make the argument clear. Um, but I do hope that those people who are wavering, and I think most people are wavering, because I think a lot of people do support free speech in principle, but are nervous about what they now call hate speech. They're nervous about the potential for incitement, and they're nervous about the way in which speech can be used to attack marginalized groups. And I acknowledge all of those positions. I'm not here to trash them. I'm 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 taking them seriously, and I I work through those arguments, and I hopefully. Uh, try to come out the other end with a robust defense of free speech in a persuasive way. That's my that's my hope. That's my intention. Whether that whether I've fulfilled that or not remains to be seen. The thing is, uh, Andrew, it seems that there are two sort of two different issues here uh, which uh, get conflated and probably rightly, actually, is that you've got the free speech thing and then you've got the whole kind of um, I know you don't use the word woke in your book, Ashley, at all, do you? You don't use the word woke, but you've got this kind of uh, totalitarianism, which means that therefore it's possible, is it not, that some people would not read your book because it's written by you? That's exactly right. I mean, there are some, uh, well, we call them woke ideologues, but th th there's something about this current social justice movement, in intersectional uh, movement, um, which has an inherent hostility to free speech, not just a failure to defend it, but an active hostility against it. And the reason for that, as I outlined, uh, is that it, it, its origins are in the, the uh, postmodern theorists of the 1960s and 1970s for whom language was how our perception of reality is constructed. So there is an undue emphasis on language, which is why today, uh, and although I do believe that the current social justice movement is not true postmodernism, it's a kind of perversion of postmodernism, but they do hold on to this idea. And you hear phrases such as words are violence. Yeah. Uh, or, or you hear them talk about how language normalizes hate, all of this kind of thing, which is an entirely faith based position that is actually debunked by all of the studies uh, into the impact of language, into the effects of media on, popular, on, on the public imagination. So we can actually look at those things. But, but this movement isn't interested in data. It isn't interested in truth. Uh, and it absolutely isn't interested in um, hearing an uh, opposing point of view because it has a kind of religious zeal and it sees all forms of dissent or disagreement as basically uh, heresy. Mm -hmm. So, yes, although it is true um, that those kind of ideologues will never pick up this book because my name is on it, um, that we mustn't get so caught up in this culture war to forget that most people are not culture warriors, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got the, the extreme culture warriors on the right and the left um, and... On the left, they are particularly powerful. They're powerful in all of our major institutions, art, art institutions, cultural, educational. They certainly dominate higher education, um, but they're still a minority, right? They're just a powerful minority. Uh, similarly, the kind of culture warriors are on the extreme right, they're a mi massive minority too. And the mo most people are somewhere in the middle. So it's all very well saying, you've written this book in a persuasive way, directly aimed at those who are unsure, but those people will never read it. Actually, that's wrong because most people are open-minded. Mm -hmm. Most people are not the woke. Uh, that's just a very small minority, which I agree, I, you know, they won't read it and that's fine. I'm, it's not really aimed at them. It's aimed at those who are somewhere in the middle. And I think that's, to be honest, I think that's most of us. And I think that's that's worthwhile. I don't believe in giving up on persuasion. I don't believe in saying, well, we'll never win this fight. So let's just go on the attack. In other words, join in the culture war. I'm interested in bringing the culture war to an end. I'm not interested in being a culture warrior. No, I mean, the, the thing about your book, actually, is that it's, uh, and I mean this in a, in a complimentary way, it's sort of accessible and it's, it's very explanatory. I mean, it doesn't assume 
that people know. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, we talk about these things all the time, pretty steeped in it. But yeah. but at the same time, you know, as you say, not everyone is obsessive uh, as maybe maybe we are about it. One thing you mm. do mention, one chapter you have, um, which I think is one of the uh, areas that most people would really, really identify with, is the one about hate speech. You've, you know, you've talked about it. Most European countries now have hate speech laws. They don't have them in America as such because of the First Amendment. Uh, but where do you stand on this, actually, Andrew? I mean, when it comes to hate speech, which it seems to be uh, basically expanding, its very nature is expanding. Do you yes. think that they, that hate speech laws are a real threat to free speech? I would say that hate speech laws are the biggest threat to free speech because we all agree that state censorship is is unacceptable and this is the current present day manifestation of that we can have arguments about other forms of censorship and other forms of other threats to free speech such as cancel culture such as big tech censorship such as self-censorship that happens when you create this culture of conformity in which we live and i'm sure we'll get on to that mm. but if we're going to go for state censorship well that's that is what hate speech laws are because that is an example of the state saying we get to decide what you're allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say um, there couldn't be a clearer example, in fact, of, of, of state censorship. Now, the problem with it, of course, as I've explained, well, there's that book by Paul Coleman called Censored, where he the book is actually predominantly uh, the, the transcripts of the various forms of hate speech legislation that occur across Europe throughout European countries. And none of them have a shared definition. Mm. You know, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has acknowledged this, that there is no possible shared definition of hate speech because the concept of hate is so subjective and the concept of what what cl is classified as as offensive is similarly subjective and so we in this country have hate speech uh, laws in the form of the public order act 1986 and the electronic communications act 2003 in that case of course uh, it stipulates that anything that is grossly offensive that is posted online uh, can be uh, prosecutable can be a criminal offense so and that again such a subjective uh, idea how, how on earth can you possibly enforce that and we have seen in our country, because as you say, we don't have a First Amendment, we don't have constitutional protections for free speech in the way that the Americans do. So what we have is uh, over a five year period, as I mentioned, between uh, um, it was 19, uh, sorry, 2014 and 2019, the police recorded 100, uh, 120,000 non-crime hate incidents. The police, as you know, have, and now routinely send tweets out saying, we'll, we'll pay a visit to you. We'll be knocking on your door if you say something that upsets someone. Uh, they're routinely arresting people for misgendering or the language that they choose to describe other people. Now, all of this is a serious encroachment on our liberties. And, and I'm really worried about the way that people aren't taking this seriously enough. There isn't really an appetite. You don't see politicians standing up and saying, we need to repeal these laws for precisely the reason that I mentioned earlier, because the worry is that if you say you don't agree or believe in hate speech laws, people will say, well, clearly you're on the side of the racists. Mm. Clearly you want racist people to say racist things. And actually, that's absolutely not what we're talking about here. Do you know, that's absolutely true. I don't think I've ever heard any politician talk about these things no. in this country anyway. Um, I think the point you, you alluded to it there, you, you talked about non-crime hate incidents. We had Harry Miller on the show some time ago. He's the guy where the police turned up and said, we need to check your thinking. Uh, you do mention that in your book. Um, but the point about these, these things, surely, Andrew, is that the police, these go on statistics, don't they? They go on records. So people basically have them on their on their records when it comes to employment checks and things yes for disclosure barring service checks the dbs yeah. check it will show up that will certainly affect your employment prospects and more to the point even if someone has simply made a complaint against you they are under no obligation to prove that there was any hateful intent it is all about perception you can yeah. check that yourself on the the government's hate speech website yeah. uh, and the crown prosecution service guidelines are very clear about this and the college of policing guidelines which are used to to instruct police yeah. and they all say the same thing that you know if someone just you know if you said something if you said something to me that was critical about my book well i'd say well how dare you and we could have a big row about it and i could say well i perceived that you did that from a homophobic point of view and it doesn't matter whether you did or not 
It doesn't matter what your sexuality is or not. Mm. It's just my perception of the situation. And then I could phone the police and that would in fact be recorded in those non-crime hate incidents, even though there's been no proof or investigation. So that's that's one thing. And that's a very scary thing in of itself. That then goes on to the official statistics for hate crime in the country, which is why maybe we're, we're seeing a constant rise in hate crime because a lot of it isn't hateful or indeed criminal. And then, as you say, the other serious aspect of that is that you are then stigmatized and it could possibly affect your employment. So it does matter. And also just, you know what, just in terms of sheer principle, if you would have asked anyone, I mean, in, including uh, those on, on the left, if you'd have asked them 15, 20 years ago, if you'd have said to them, you know, in by 2021, the police will, in this country will routinely be investigating people for non-crime, no one would have believed you. Absolutely no one. So if we, you know, if we're talking about this slippery slope, well, there it is in action. It's absolutely demonstrable. And 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 the reason it keeps happening is because people won't won't stand up against it and say, "I'm sorry, enough is enough." In fact, it's going the other way. You know, you had the law commission the other day pushing for expansion of hate speech laws. I know that didn't necessarily go through, but the SNP are are incredibly authoritarian. Humza Youssef, the justice secretary, pushing through his new hate crime bill, which would see. Um, private conversations in the home are uh, criminalized if they stir up hatred. No one seems to know what that means, of course, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just about setting a mandate for, for government to arrest people for what they say in their homes. There's even a section of that bill that talks about the public performance of a play. And he was asked about this in the Scottish Parliament. And he said, you know, a group of far right people could get together and put on a play. And as I said at the time, I, I don't know. I don't know any neo Nazis, but I know for sure they're not into amateur dramatics. No. I don't think they could. I don't think they could deal with it. You know. No, exactly. No, I think the point you've actually come onto what I was going to ask you actually next there is that this uh, subjectivity, first of all, is extraordinary to the point where uh, Jordan Peterson tweeted something recently. He had no idea about how the law was actually worded in this country and he was taken aback by it and he he tweeted and i i remember replying saying i'm afraid it is the case um the next one down i think probably andrew will be misogyny i mean i think that this is kind of bubbling away isn't it that this will become a hate crime yes these things are forever expanding yeah. and there's all sorts of groups who are particularly when it comes to intersectionality which of course divides everyone up in terms of their various demographics yeah. they're going to keep pushing for this i remember seeing that tweet from jordan peterson and it doesn't surprise me because i think a lot of people in the usa and in canada don't realize uh the extent of the problems in this country um, and and part of the reason is they seem so unbelievable don't they yes they, they seem so obviously dystopian i mean even that phrase you mentioned we need to check your thinking. Yeah, yeah. You can't describe that as anything other than Orwellian. It is thought police. Mm. That's exactly what it is. So, you know, I don't have much truck with these people who say, oh, well, the use of Orwell has become a bit of a cliche. Yeah, it's a cliche because it's so pertinent. That's, that's the problem. I think, uh, you know, in my own, from my own experience in the London Assembly, uh, I went to, had to question the police. And I used this example of Harry Miller. And in fact, they actually made the point that you made there, which was simply that we have to be aware that these things escalate, that what starts out as something like that, their automatic assumption, despite what the judge said in that case, was that there was going to be a kind of escalation that therefore you, the implication being there would be violence or, or whatever. But Well, you know, um, Philip K. Dick had a phrase for that, and that's pre-crime. Yes, um, yeah. By the way, uh, there has been the necessary research undertaken into this. Do you know how many of those non-crime hate incidents did in fact develop into criminal activity? No. The answer is zero, yeah. none. There are no recorded uh, incidents of where that has actually happened. So we know it's not true. It's, this is one of the incredible things about this whole movement is there is this faith-based thing, this idea that we just assume that this is the case. It's the same when people talk about systemic racism. They will say Oxford yeah. University is institutionally systemically racist. And then you'll look at the statistics that show you quite clearly that racism is one of the least racist places in the not just the country, but the world. You know, the, you, the, the incidents of racism just rarely happen there. But they will just deny, deny, deny. They'll just say, oh, well, then we'll ignore that because that those statistics don't take into account lived experience or they'll come up with some kind of a nebulous reason why the data isn't correct and and it, it's a it's a failure to confront reality and and, and similarly here you just get your things are taken on faith when uh, reality tells us something very different um so that that is another problem which which i suppose is unrelated because that's more to do with the the social justice movement but but it is connected isn't it it's completely connected uh you know 
if you were, you know, you've you've written plays, haven't you? And you've written, you know, particularly, you know, for Titania McGrath being one of them in Edinburgh, and obviously you are were a stand-up uh, comic. I think I imagine you're not doing so much of that at the moment, but uh, well, there are no stand-up comics at the no, moment, really. No, exactly. <laughs> Other than the ones doing it over Zoom, and I, you know, I admire their pluck, uh, but it's not something I could ever do. I, I, I don't know how that would work, really. But with the, but with the, the Scottish proposals, it particularly, as you said, affects performance, hmm. and this thing about d- the domestic arena being able to criminalise speech in the. Do- you know, it is extraordinary, is it not, that the Prime Minister, for example, has not just simply said, sorry, you know, forget it. You know, this is ridiculous. Yeah. There's been nothing. And this is what is so worrying, isn't it? It's become really difficult for politicians to stand up and do that because immediately the accusation is that they are supporting some of the worst people in society because they say that they should be able to speak. Um, that's how. That's why it's, it's actually just very difficult for politicians who want to be re-elected. And also there has been a kind of cultural shift on this issue. You, you don't really get much defense even no. from artists, performers. You know, a, a good comparison, which I've used before, and I, I mentioned in the book, I think, is if you go back to the Tony Blair era when he was trying to push through the Racial and Religious Hatred Act, was that 2006? Yes, it was Maybe. the one with Rowan Atkinson where he protested, That's I right. believe, yeah. That's right, so you had comedians pretty much unanimous saying this can't go through and that was that campaign was spearheaded by Rowan Atkinson as you as you say and there were letters to the press and all sorts of things and and because you know comedians understood that all it would take is one person complaining about an Edinburgh show say a stand-up show at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and then that show would be shut down while at pending investigation by the police and of course financially that's ruinous uh, for anyone who's ever been to Edinburgh as an act knows that they, they they plow a lot of money into it and they don't get the return, even if they're relatively well known. So that would have been terrible. So comedians were, were you know, absolutely unanimous. And also they were they were about defending artistic expression. Mm. Um, however, that's changed. Right. So when the Marcus Meekin case occurred a few years ago, the, the famous Nazi pug case mm. where he made a joke video of his girlfriend's pug dog and he taught it to a Nazi salute. Um, and and respond enthusiastically to phrases such as Zieg Heil and gas the Jews, not pleasant phrases. That was the whole point of the joke. It was the juxtaposition of the cuteness of the animal and the horror of the phrases that that were the trigger phrases. So, um, but of course it was a joke. It was even explained within the video that it was a joke. You might say it was offensive, it was distasteful. I understand why some Jewish people who lost relatives in the Holocaust would be horrified by that joke, but it was a joke nonetheless. And, and, and yet he was prosecuted in a court of law. It went all the way and he was found guilty ultimately. And he now has a criminal record uh, under the hate speech laws, the uh, Communications Act 2003. Now that's a very serious uh, infringement on, on civil liberties. That's a real worry. But at the time, I defended him. One or two other comedians defended him. Uh, basically, none of the, the vast majority of comedians actually started attacking people like me who were defending him. And that's in what 2017 around there. So something has happened yeah. between the Tony Blair era in 2006. There has been a kind of sea change uh, among artists and among creatives where even they uh, no longer trust artistic expression. I think uh, no longer trust artistic expression. I, I, I would almost go further than that, actually. And if, in my experience, at least, not not with comedy, but in the arts, is that they're quite happy to be the carriers of the message, it seems to me. Yeah. Oh, it's so boring, isn't it? You know, yeah. every time you, you, you go on Netflix or something and you see a message telling you, oh, well, this film made 50 years ago might have might have been made in a different cultural context with different values. And I'm thinking, really? <laughs> I probably knew that because I'm not stupid. Uh, this patronising, uh, you know, coddling thing that these big corporations feel. And I think people are sick of it because when they see the way things are cast uh, uh, to, to prioritise diversity, it isn't that there are different racial groups being represented on TV. I've never cared about that. And frankly, I never used to notice it. Mm. It's just not something that that, that bothers me. Um, and it would be weird, wouldn't it, if, if, if everyone in all the TV shows was white? I, I would say that's, that is a problem, mm. but that hasn't been the case for many, many years. Yeah. Um, but, but the reason why people resent it is because they don't like being hectored, because there's this sense, isn't there, that what these t- TV program makers and filmmakers are saying is, you lot out there, you're all evil racists, and you need to understand that diversity is good. We know that diversity is good. We're not racist. We don't need to be preached at. 
certainly not by avaricious corporations whose only goal really is to squeeze as much money as they can out of the rest of us. Uh, uh, absolutely, yes. Do you think with hate, hate speech laws, would you just repeal them? Would you just yeah. get rid of them? You would. Yeah, 100 percent. Just get rid of them. I don't think hate speech laws have any place on the statute books of a liberal democracy. I don't think the state has any right to decide what people can and cannot say. There are some thorny issues around incitement, incitement to violence, as you know, uh, has always been illegal under English common law. Um, and But I think the threshold has to be very high. You know, I don't think it's sufficient to say that... Um, uh, metaphor, military metaphors, for instance, qualify as incitement to violence, as was levelled towards Boris Johnson yeah. when he was using phrases like uh, betrayal and surrender bill. Um, you know, political language is combative and colourful. That, that You know, nobody's going to hear Boris Johnson use the word betrayal and pick up a gun and go out and shoot people. That's not how this works. And they, I thought it was quite shameful, actually, uh, when certain politicians tried to connect mm. his language to the death of Joe Cox. Mm. Uh, because, they, they, you know, in order to make that kind of accusation, you better have some evidence that there was a direct, that there was causality there. There is no evidence of that whatsoever, you know. And, and I think that's the problem. And we know as well. Uh, I mentioned this in the book about media effects theory. We have had six decades of research into the way in which uh, mass media consumption has an impact on public behavior. And the answer is it doesn't. Mm. People aren't mechanically acting on cues. And yet still, again, this is one of those things that's totally taken on faith. You remember in 2019 when the movie Joker was out, yeah. there, were, there were loads of articles by people saying, oh, well, this is irresponsible material. This will cause young men to go out and cause commit violence. People were even fearing that, that young men would go out and shoot up people in the in the cinema. Um, there was a weird sense in which it felt like these writers were sort of hoping for it in a yeah, way because yeah, it would confirm, yeah. confirm yeah. their prejudices. But look, there's no evidence at all that that that, that happens whatsoever. And, and you know, uh, the direct effects model of media effects theory has been completely discredited. But people don't want to look at the facts, don't want to look at reality. They want a simple solution. You know, when you see some horrific thing like the Christchurch massacre, where those Muslim worshippers were m murdered by this far-right extreme terrorist evil let's just call it what it is evil man and of course people want to come up with some solution that it's at it, well because that's inexplicable isn't it yes. so what they do is they look at they look at the the websites he was looking at they say oh look he shared this daily express article mm. the week before the murders as though that is in any way connected to the event itself uh and 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 like i say i have sympathy for that when i hear a, a new story like that it, it, it upsets me. I want to know why. Mm. And, and it's much easier to have a simple explanation that can just say, you know, and this has always been the case, hasn't it? You remember back with the um, the James Bolger murder? Yeah. Um, the, the immediate knee-jerk reaction by the press was the responsibility was the filmmakers of Child's Play 3 mm. because there was a copy of that video at the home of the boys. In fact, I think as it turns out, they didn't even watch the, the film because mm. there's a scene in the, in the film on a train track. On a, uh, it's actually a fairground ride, but the press said it was a train track and, and that connected to the James Bolger merger, murder. And again, that murder was inexplicable. You, you looked at that and you thought, how could two 10 year old boys possibly, possibly torture and kill a, a small child? And you want to make sense of it. And so therefore, here's a solution. It was this movie that did it. They watched yeah, the yeah. film and then they committed the act. Now, so I get it, but we have to, as adults, look into the research on this and, and acknowledge that there is no causality, there is no connection there, and that we're, we're going to have to look for answers elsewhere. The, one of the overriding problems, surely, in all of this as well, is is that whatever the laws have brought in, because you you know you talk about hate speech laws, or say official bodies, but not legal bodies, if you like, such as uh, Ofcom, they've also widened what is considered to be hate speech on television to an absurd level, many people would say. But therefore, the main problem, surely, the main threat to the whole situation is self-censorship, which yeah. I, would, I would suggest is now pretty much the default position, isn't it? It has to be. It has to be. Because, I mean, if you take the example of when, um, I can't remember the channel that ditched uh, the, the episode of Faulty Towers called The Germans, oh, uh, yes. because in, in that episode, the, the character of the Major used a racial epithet and of course, as John Cleese said afterwards, when he was writing those lines, uh, the major is meant to be this old uh, mm. relic of a different time. He says those words in order that the, mm. the, the show is mocking him. Mm. He's, the, he's the person we're laughing at for using these antediluvian 
offensive phrases. That's the whole point. But 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 this literal minded thing, all they hear is, oh, uh, there's an offensive word. Therefore, it's offensive. Therefore, we need to shut it down. Now, that means, of course, let's extrapolate that. Let's take that principle. That means that any writer who wants to have a character who is morally dubious, who says morally dubious things, well, now, because of this literal minded interpretation, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Mm. Uh, or what if you want to represent some horrific act uh, of violence or, or horrific attitudes or ideas? Right. Because sometimes dramatists and artists want to delve into those areas and want to want to represent those things faithfully. But if you can't do that without someone uh, uh, slapping a label on your work or indeed withdrawing your work or indeed saying this work isn't going to be published because because this character is offensive, then the inevitable corollary of that is that artists will begin to self-censor. And they do. And I know they do because they tell me they do. I speak to artists all the time, creators, people contact me, comedians, I have to say who do say that they're, 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 they're just not going to go into these areas. And that means that art suffers unless artists can be free to just follow their muse, you know, to, to, to explore things and, and represent things as they wish. Then um, the whole medium will suffer the whole, you know, art can't work that way. Well, it, basically, I'd say it's, a, it's an attack actually on the very f foundations of culture. Uh, you know, you simply can't go on in, in that uh, situation. Which is which is why I always remind people, and I do say in the book, that self-censorship ultimately is a choice. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, I think I think if you want to be a true artist, you have to uh, be free and you have to not um, curb yourself on the basis of, of other people. However, there's also the reality of the business of living, and most of us don't are not independently wealthy. Uh, and, and, you know, Kazuo Ishiguro, the great novelist Kazuo yeah. Ishiguro, yesterday uh, said that he was very concerned, not for himself, He's an established novelist. He's won the Booker Prize. He's he's you know he doesn't have to worry about <laughs> about getting published uh, or indeed selling books. Um, but he does. He said that young writers today, particularly young novelists, are are not going to be free to express themselves because they're not established. Mm. That's the worry. It's always the worry with the younger generation, with with new artists coming up, is that they're now writing within very tight limits mm. of acceptability. And uh, although it's possible historically, you know, artists have worked within those limits. It takes sort of geniuses uh, like Da Vinci, you know, uh, if it, it, it does because you have to find ways to work not to upset the Vatican, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> that, that's the problem you know, Michelangelo. If, you, if you're painting the Sistine Chapel and, uh, you know, you find ways to be subversive without, there are actually some very subversive images there, but they got past the Vatican. It's very smartly done. Yeah. But however, we're not, all, we're not all able to do that. And we do, we should have that artistic freedom. People have fought and died for this, mm -hmm. you know? How much of a, a, a free speech fundamentalist would you say you are? And when I say that, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, you know, uh, you shouldn't, you know, scream fire in a cinema or whatever. It's, it's a bit of a that's a bit of a, uh, a red herring, I think, actually. I think every, everyone would sort of agree with that. But, for example, I think it was Christopher Hitchens talked about this, you know, and Orwell, Orwell said, you know, it's being able to tell people what they don't want to hear. But, I mean, should, for example, people who deny the Holocaust, should they, should their free speech be protected? I think it should. And the reason I think it should is the best way to deal with those who are completely wrong about history, and particularly from a, a malevolent intent, yeah. is to destroy their arguments using the evidence of history. Now, you'll know, for instance, with the case of David Irving, yeah. who actually served prison time for denying the Holocaust. Um, it was actually Richard Evans, the historian Richard Evans, who took him down because he demonstrated um, how flawed uh, Irving's analysis was. And it was irrefutable. And it was far more powerful. If you lock someone up like that, it just gives credence. You know, all of a sudden, all of these conspiratorial people are thinking, oh, well, maybe he's got a point. It gives him a kind of glamour, glamorous sheen mm. that he doesn't deserve. It makes him a sort of martyr figure. And the best way, I mean, I know there's a lot of concern about fake news and things like that, but absolutely the best way to combat fake news and, and people being wrong about factual events is to counter it with, with better yeah. research. And I'm also very concerned that, that, that for fake news, for a start, has generally been used as an epithet or a, a way to write off inconvenient news, uh, things that people just don't agree with. A lot of these fact checkers that are employed by social media companies, for instance, are very ideologically partisan. Mm. And they will say things are factually untrue because they just don't want them to be true. Mm. That's a problem. So, you know, absolutely, I am 
I have to say, uh, an absolutist when it comes to, to free speech. I don't approve of um, Holocaust denial, of course, or any kind of abuse, actually. I'm very into politeness and decorum. I really disapprove of, of, of incivility, and I don't engage. If someone's not civil, I won't engage with them. I'll just block them and move on because I want to talk to other adults yeah. who are able to have civil discussions. But that is not incompatible with a free speech absolutist position. In fact, the two, as far as I'm concerned, are extremely compatible. Yes. Uh what what about this other big threat that we are well it certainly concerns the likes of me doing channels like this from big tech uh do you take that seriously very seriously i think it's the next big uh, free speech battle because firstly we have to win the argument we have to explain to people that this argument of well they're they're private companies they can do what they want that is an argument that's about 20 years out of date we have to acknowledge the, the sheer impact that social media has, the power that it holds. It is the de facto public square. It is uh, the main principal realm of discourse throughout the globe. You know, this, it, it, you know, and we know that we know that when a few companies have this kind of oligopoly, uh, governments do intervene. That's why antitrust laws exist. Uh, we know that there is a problem here. And I understand that particularly those who are for the free market, libertarians, uh, are often concerned about intervening when it comes to private companies. But look, there's a way to there's a way to do this because it isn't just the case that they're uh, they have these terms of services which they enforce. They will also destroy any competition in its nascent form. You know, Parler was set up. This was a, a platform to rival Twitter, and the social the social media tech giants collaborated to basically destroy Parler. So it's not the case that you can just go off and set up your own internet no, or set up your own. It, it can't be done. So we have to acknowledge that, uh, and we have to talk about the issue that, that you know these are multi-billion dollar corporations with more collective power than any nation state and yet they have none of the democratic accountability that's a risk that's a threat to free speech and it is one that we have to take seriously it's extraordinary isn't it that sort of people perhaps on the left actually you know they find themselves defending these big corporations and say well you know they're just private yes. companies you know they're just private companies only, be only because they agree with them yes that's all it, yes. i mean it's, it's, yes. it's utterly hilarious to me i don't think you can call yourself left wing if you're cheering on a, a multi-billion dollar corporation can you no, or, so, or no. saying to those people that you want them to decide on the yeah. parameters of accept acceptable speech i think that's a really funny actually laugh out loud funny contradiction but i also think um that, that it's, it fails to recognize the power that they have and it's also very myopic because it's it's not looking into the future well these people might agree with you at the moment certainly the biden administration will have no appetite to deal with the problem of big tech censorship because they tend to be aligned with their message but what happens in the future what happens when you set this precedent and 20 years from now uh the the, the people who are in charge of big tech don't agree with you anymore you'll have no recourse at that point because you spent years saying they should be able to censor whoever they want well that's going to bite you in the end isn't it at the end of your book actually you 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 paint a a possible scenario uh you're not saying this is inevitably going to be the case but it's a quite a bleak one you know uh which is one of sh utter conformity I, I don't think you have to go that far in the future because i mean i don't know about you but i kind of feel that a bit now um that in you know that somehow this is what the way things could pan out how do we stop that being the future? I'm not, as I say, this is just one thing you say could happen. What do we do to sort of actually prevent that? Uh, we've got to win the argument. Uh, I think too many people have accepted that, or, or accepted the false premise that freedom of speech uh, threatens minority rights. Uh, that, that freedom of speech is something that is dispensable, really, and, and that, you know, we shouldn't worry too much about uh, granting the state these unlimited powers to control what we say and think. We need to win that argument again. And I know that, you know, just looking at history, it's not something, something, you know, it's relatively recent, actually, that we have free speech. You know, mm -hmm. societies throughout history generally haven't mm -hmm. had this. It's quite miraculous that we've achieved this, and, it, and we should be grateful for that. But we've got to hold on to it. It's not something that is you win the argument and then you've got it forevermore. No, it's constantly going to slip away because that, that is the nature of human nature, that there are always going to be power hungry people, people, megalomaniacs who are going to exploit their power uh, in order to control other people. And so therefore, we need to win the argument again and again with each successive generation. And this is my uh, modest uh, contribution to that effort. Well, I mean, the thing is, it is uh, it, it's extremely succinct and I, I think required reading 
And and if but if you were to if you were to go into university and so if you were to sort of say oh let's discuss free speech, and here's my my book on it, and you know I've no axe to grind other than the subject. Uh, at the moment, the way things are, probably you get short shrift, wouldn't you? Well, that's the problem that we face: is that we have to win the argument, but we also have to persuade people that the argument is worth having in the first place. Yes, uh, yeah. and 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 with, with this incredible denialism that we have you know since gavin williamson's announcement about the the state of free speech on university campuses we just had across the board denialism uh, from publications such as the guardian yeah. from a lot of students from the nus uh from the union of colleges uh, all just saying there is no problem with free speech on university campuses and of course as i mentioned in the footnotes i i, I link to a number of studies from groups such as the policy exchange unit mm. uh just showing the extent of, of the stifling of, of the free exchange of ideas on university campuses, it is verifiable. Mm. Denying that there is a problem is not gonna fix the problem. You can't just wish these things away. Uh, my hope is that a sufficient numbers of people, as I say, there will always be those intransigent, intransigent people who are not going to pick yeah. up this book, who, who will think that it's all a lie, a ruse, because what I want is to be able to have a go at minorities with impunity. That's clearly what they're going to think, because, you know, they're, they're, they are no longer capable of argumentation. They're too sort of ideologically captured. But I think for the majority of people, and this does include the majority of students, they will be open to having this discussion. I gave a talk at Aberystwyth University uh, and the students were really up for hearing different ideas being challenged it was actually the members of staff it was actually the academics who refused to publicize the event because they said any talk that was uh, skeptical about the woke movement would be against their diversity policy yeah. they hadn't even heard the talk and it was actually the academics who are causing so many of the problems not the students so i have great faith in the younger generation and i have the great faith in students generally and you know you can always cite a few uh, zealots with who go into student politics, but they are always the minority. They always have been. It's it's never been the case that the majority of students are even interested in student politics. Um, unfortunately, those few who do get involved in those committees then wield power, and they get to decide what their mm. what their peers can and cannot hear. That's the problem, really. So I would I would sort of urge. I think it's really great. Uh, there's the new Free Speech Champions Initiative, yeah, yeah. Um, which which is actually you know targeting. Uh, universities getting students involved set up um, groups I did a talk at the uh, London School of Economics there was a, um, a, a free speech uh, society there and I gave a talk for that that's now a few years ago to be honest um, but that was one of the early examples of, of this I think someone actually tried to get them cancelled with no sense of irony um, but that <laughs> that is that is what we need we need more and more younger people to be braver and to sort of say, no, we want to have these difficult conversations. We're not going to be shut down. We're not going to let you say that a gender critical feminist is hateful and transphobic, even though she's never said anything that's hateful or transphobic. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to have the difficult conversations. And if you don't want to participate, you're free not to, you know, but you, what you don't get to do is to decide that we don't get to talk about it. Yeah, we the free speech uh, champions people we had on the channel actually a while ago. So it's a great initiative. Andrew, have you ever been, what's your experience been of your own free speech being curtailed? Well, it hasn't really. You know, I don't, I don't think I've been censored. I don't think, you know, I've been booted off Twitter a few times. That's the extent of it. Um, um, but, you know, I, I don't believe, you know, I've got a platform. I've, you know, I'm in a very privileged position. I go on television, I go on radio, I write for the national press. I mean, I can't then do all that and complain that my free speech has been taken away. It absolutely isn't. Yeah. Um, but of course, this idea, um, I mean, I've had a lot of people tweet about my book saying, oh, look at this person getting a book deal and complaining that his free speech has been taken away. It's not a complaint I've ever made. That It's perfectly possible to be concerned, to be concerned about something that doesn't impact you directly. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the people I'm worried about are, you know, cancel culture disproportionately affects uh, working ordinary people who don't have the resources, the financial resources to defend themselves, uh, which is why the free speech union uh, set up by Toby Young is so important. Um, but, we, but, but, you know, they don't have um, the ability or the platform to redress this problem. This idea that cancel culture is just holding the powerful to account is completely backward. It's completely wrong. The people who get affected are the supermarket worker who loses his job for sharing a clip on Facebook or whatever. Mm. You know, it's, it's normal people. Uh, and so therefore, I think we need to, uh, I, I, my own personal circumstance, I mean, I have lost work uh, for my opinions. I've lost work for my um for the jokes that i tell or whatever but i don't consider that 
you know, that's that's fine. That's not I don't consider myself to be centered because I don't rely on the work that I've lost. You yeah. know, yeah. I mean, it's not good, it's not a good situation. I'm not going to complain about it because I have a platform and I like, like I said, I've got a publishing deal. Why should I worry? Well, I only worry about other people. Yes, that's what makes sense. No, no, of course it does. Absolutely. <laughs> and also, I mean, the, the fact is it, this will speak to a huge number of people. I would say that more than any other uh, comments we get on this channel, it's about the issue of free speech, about fear, about not being able to say what they feel. This, this is the biggest thing. Um, Andrew, thanks very much. It, the, the book, it, Free Speech, and why it matters. Andrew Doyle there. It's available. Obviously, most people get these books on Amazon now, don't they? Uh, but, uh, and it's really, really very worth it. Thank you very much, Andrew, for coming on and, uh, you know, talking to us about it. And um, thanks for this contribution. So, uh, well, thank, you, thank you very much for having me. I, I always appreciate coming on to your show, Peter. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we shall see you again soon. I, I, I very much hope. Thank you very much. And that is it uh, this week. For so what you're saying is, please do uh, join us next week. In the meantime, do remember, won't you, to subscribe. I say that every week, uh, but please do, won't you? Thank you very, very much indeed. Bye.